I am Mally Moore. And I'm Dustin Goes to Hollywood. And this is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's most bleak endings. Fuck you. <laughs> For being able to get it. it the first fucking time. <laughs> Fuck you, dude. I, that shit's hard as fuck to read for wrong. some reason. You ain't wrong. Anyway, hi guys. Uh, this <laughs> is episode seven, I believe, uh, entitled "Buried," and this is the one. This is and like one of the. This is the one we have been waiting for. This is the whole reason we decided to do this show. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're not familiar with this movie, we'll t- talk about it. But first, let's talk about ourselves. If you're new to the show, this is a podcast where we try to take a movie that's got a dark, bleak, downer, fucked up ending, and we try to find the good in it. And yeah. sometimes it's easier than others. Uh, we've had our work cut out for us. We've gone after like the big ones. Yeah, like, we... D- we started off we with should Requiem have, for a Dream. We should have started out with an easy one, but we really no. Should've. We had to go out Make with... Make it hard. Yeah. So this is our last episode before we're going to get into our Halloween, October month. We're going to have nothing oh, but horror movies. It's going to be good times. So this is our My last... time of year, Our sir. last uh, a fun one that isn't uh, horror related. Fun? Well, they're fun. Some of them. Oh, at least one of us had fun. Well, yeah. You made me break my rule concerning this movie. <laughs> Not watching it again? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I loved this. I saw this movie. It was an early screening before it hit theaters mm-hmm. when I still live in Indiana. And I loved this movie so much, but I never wanted to watch it again because it made me so uncomfortable and so sad. I'm right there with you, but I'm also the complete And then you opposite. were like, dude, we got to do Buried. I was like, God damn it. <laughs> That's the main reason I wanted to do this show. When I pitched this idea to you, this is the movie I had in mind. I was like, dude, Buried, I've, there's something good. There's got to be something good at the end of that movie. And we uh, will find out. I'm the total opposite. I see this. I, this is one of my top three favorite yeah, movies. You watch this time. movie on the regular. A lot. And that's because I use it in my day to day and all my writing. I go back to this movie as like a gold mine of a fountain of like inspiration. <laughs> I had a similar experience though. Like when I first saw You've it. You've been buried I, alive, huh? Yeah. And when I first saw it, I went to, it was had a limited release and I went to the one theater that was showing it and it was showing it at like one time as well. And uh, I took my girlfriend at the time to see it, and there was only two other people in the theater. So it was just four of us total. So I'm watching the movie, and I'm hooked from the opening credits, like all the way down to the post credit stinger scene. And before the credits started rolling, dude, my jaw was on the floor. Yeah. When you get to that twist at the end, which we'll get there, but I was literally in shock. And I. I sat through the whole credit sequence. Oh, yeah. Just, I couldn't move. I was like, what the fuck? Well, and like, so when I go see a movie, like, especially nowadays, because like, like with Marvel movies, like everyone's doing a post credit scene. Like, mm-hmm. so I always go in like, not, okay, I won't say I check beforehand, but once the credits start, pop up my phone real quick. Like, is there post credits? I no? do that cool. too. I do that too. This movie I stayed for the entire credits. Not expecting Just because this. I couldn't move out of shock. Yep. That's exactly what happened to me. It's... And that end credit song does not help at all. No, but we'll, we'll, we'll get, get that. there. We'll get there. <laughs> um, so this movie, again, is buried. Uh, it's from 2010. It's from director Rodrigo Cortez. Uh, and st- I just put starring Ryan Reynolds because yeah, that's, that's all you need to know. That's it. That's the only person you see on screen, unless you count the video uh, from his coworker. But really, it's just, I, Ron Reynolds is the star. Wait, and like, and they advertise this movie like what? Like it only takes place in one yeah. coffin. Yeah. And they were not kidding. So the budget for this movie was three million dollars and had a gross of nineteen million. So for the most part, all the movies we've done have been successful in terms yeah. of the box office. And this movie. We're breaking the streak of the 60s. We're at 87 certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, that's why, like, because like, I back, I've backed Ryan Reynolds for years. I wish he sir. would do more dramatic stuff. I really yes. Do. Or, or thriller stuff like this. Because so many people are like, what, that dude from Van Wilder? Like, yeah. No. I'm like, have you seen Barry? They're like, no. I'm like, shut up. No one has Opinion seen this Opinion invalid. I'm convinced no one has seen this movie. Yeah. I think when people click on this episode, they're like, what the fuck movie is buried? Oh, no, dude. I recommend this movie all the Probably time. once a week, All and time. every time, this is how it goes. Oh, dude, you should watch Buried. Yeah, you want to come over and watch it with me later? No. Yeah. 
<laughs> or the opposite. Like, I'm like, hey, man, you should see, you should really need to watch the movie Buried. Okay. And then two days later, dude, fuck you for recommending <laughs> that movie. That's usually how it goes. Oh, this um, movie will mess you up. Yeah. And the trailer, we'll, we'll talk about it, but let, let's play let's it for him and then we'll talk. Most F. I'm from Hastings, Michigan. I'm a driver for CRT. My convoy was ambushed. I'm buried in a coffin in the ground, and I need help. Please send help. I'm begging you. How did you end up in the coffin, sir? I was put here. You American? Yeah. Five million money to nine more to stay buried like dog. United States Department of State. I'm an American citizen. My convoy was attacked, and I'm being held for ransom. I need five million dollars, bro. We left to die here. These threats are real, and will be followed through on. I just have a few questions for you, Mr. Connor. You gotta be kidding me. It's important that I get this information. It'll help wait, me wait, hold on, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. How do you know my name? What's going on right now? Listen to me, okay? These guys didn't know where we lived. They have my driver's license. Do not go back to the house. Nobody's gonna pay $5 million for me. Where there's little we can do from Washington. Your ransom video already has 47,000 hits on YouTube. Where is money? I need more time, please. You show blood. What? You got finger. What are you doing right now to help it? Let me out of here, and I promise you I will get you the money. No, 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 no. no. Fuck that trailer, yeah, man. The trailer gives away too much. Yeah. It's a, okay. It's a little too long. It's the idea behind the concept of the trailer is genius. Yeah. If you, I mean, obviously this is an audio podcast, so you need to go see it, but yeah. <laughs> if you get a chance to see it, the trailer only uses screen caps from the movie and there's no actual footage. So, but there's a shit ton of dialogue. A lot. Of, you get almost the full spectrum of the story. Uh, I will say it's great editing. I mean, they, they do. Oh, yeah. It's so cool the movie looking. utilizes this idea of like <laughs> being buried underground so the trailer is constantly moving down yeah. and in and out uh using like these lines to guide you through it and it's the similar same thing that happens with the opening credits of the movie and i think it's awesome oh the opening credits rule so the trip with the trailer itself i think is away a little too much but if you haven't seen the movie obviously stop right now go watch it and then come back because yeah. we're about to spoil the shit out of it and at the end of it we're gonna <laughs> we're try to have to a yeah. certain point we're gonna try and find the good, the silver lining at the end of Buried. So you ready? Let's go. I'm you already ready. made me watch it. I'm, as ready I'm in as too deep. Be. Uh, and go. Yeah. I think these opening credits are amazing. I think yeah. Hitchcock would be proud. Most of. I think the whole movie, Hitchcock would be pretty proud. But these opening credits are so reminiscent of Psycho and Rear Window and oh, all those yeah. this, classics. Oh, yeah. This movie... Screams. owes a lot to some Hitchcock. It screams Hitchcock. Um, we go through these opening credits. It's got this awesome, like, intense music that's playing, this orchestra playing. Uh, and then we kind of fade into a black screen. And we sit on black for a long time. Uh, the movie starts out on black. And I think it's a great choice because you you wake up no, in a coffin. No, it works so well. You wake up in a coffin, you wouldn't see shit anyway. So uh, we hear Ryan Reynolds kind of moving around, screaming for help. And all of a sudden, he realizes he has a Zippo. So this is the first image we see is him flickering on this, the Zippo after about probably two minutes of and being on black. it's gorgeous. This movie has got some... The shot, not Ryan Reynolds. Oh, well, no, no, no. He's yeah. also gorgeous. Um, that's, my, that's one of my first but notes. Yeah. that shot is... Just I, throughout this entire movie, that I, that is one of your notes. Yeah, one of my notes is just I think this movie's got oh amazing camera God. work and a great lighting. Wait, who with, DP'd this? Shout out to that dude. I can't remember the guy's name, but with such a limited space, I think he they did a phenomenal job with both the lighting yeah, and the they camera work. Pulled this um, off so well. So he manages to get this muffle out of his out of his mouth, and he's bound he's bound at the hands and feet as well. Uh, and there's like a, a basically a nail that's protruding above him, and he manages to get his uh, bandages off. Which I gotta say, thank God for that nail. Otherwise, this movie would have been a lot longer, right? If, if he couldn't have got out. But he's using the Zippo, and that's like his only light source. So we're seeing uh, our first images are just seeing that Ryan Reynolds is indeed buried alive in a box. So this box is probably a little bit bigger than regular size coffin. Uh, I'd say it's probably four feet wide. Maybe eight to ten feet long, uh, maybe a little bit less than that, but it's it's very confined. Wait, quick shout out to the DP. His name is Ed Edward Gro Gro Grau. I don't know how to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. He's from Barcelona. Yeah, they're they're all from Spain. He's done some stuff, dude. Like what? Um, 
The Awakening. Um, it's that Rebecca Hall like horror movie. Not Dominic familiar. West. Not oh, it's actually pretty cool. I highly recommend. Okay. Um, the Gift. I didn't get to see the, the Gift. Jo- I know the oh, gift. man. I know the Gift. I haven't okay. seen it. Okay. He, he uh, DP'd that. And also, A Single Man. I haven't seen that either. God damn it. I'll watch The Gift because that's the one I know. But I, haven't, I don't know the rest of those. Never mind. Uh, well, somebody on this podcast just geeked out. I mean, somebody listening. So, I'm glad that someone cares. Um. So, yeah, he manages to get himself out, and he realizes he's in this coffin, and he's freaking out. Uh, he's got a Zippo, and he's got a Blackberry, and the Blackberry happens to have Signal and a full battery. So, I think that's all he has at this point, right? Oh, he's got a pen. I'm sorry, he's got a pen. He's got a pen, yeah, a Zippo, yeah, 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 and he's yeah. got a Blackberry. So, the first thing he does is open the phone, he opens the Blackberry, and it turns out it's in uh, Arabic. So he can't fucking read it. But he decides he's I've gonna... been there. I accidentally turned my phone to like something once. Yeah. And it just I I didn't have a phone for like two days. So we realize he's in another country because he doesn't dial nine one one. He dials zero zero one nine one one, which is like the international code for nine one one in the Americas. So he calls nine one one and he gets someone on the other line. And I have to say, right off the bat, be prepared for this for the rest of the movie. No one in this movie, other than Ryan Reynolds, understands urgency. No one gives a shit dude. or empathy. <laughs> no one cares that he's in this coffin. Like you would, like okay, if I called someone, was like, "Hey, I'm buried alive." I would hope they'd be like, "Oh fuck, holy shit!" Let's, uh, yeah, like, okay, let's help. Out. Yeah, no one. Instead, cares. they're just like, "Oh shit, really? No, that's that's tough, crazy, dude. man." Yeah. So we get introduced to his character. His name what? is Paul Conroy. He mentions that he is a truck driver uh in iraq for some company uh and he's been buried alive in a in a coffin yeah so he calls 911 in the states and uh someone's like you know sir i don't know how you got this number if you're calling from another country and he's like look just put me through to the fbi and the woman on the other end's like well which fbi i've got fbis in chicago and new york he's like i really don't care and she's like well sir i can't just connect you to anyone i'm not allowed to you have to tell me he, i think he says chicago or something like that yeah so she, he gets connected to Special Agent Harris, who is an FBI uh, just head of, I don't know what you would call him, but something. he starts to ask him, and this is where we start to get our backstory. He says, you know, my name is Paul Conroy. I'm a truck driver for C- Creston Roland, and I can't remember what the T is. CRT is basically the name of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, what I'm guessing is they supply, they uh, give supplies to soldiers in the Middle East in the uh, Dagobah, not Dagobah, that's fucking... Da- what? <laughs> <laughs> in Baghdad, movie you... I'm thinking Empire. You just back. confused Dagobah and <laughs> no, it's Baghdad. Baghdad in the something Providence. I can't remember what it's called. I want to say it's the like Dagobah. I really do think it's like something like that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. He's in Iraq, and uh, apparently his truck was ambushed, God and damn it. he blacked Best out. <laughs> what if he was on Dagobah? <laughs> oh my God! Uh, and that's his... a crossover Wait, opportunity yeah. that I can. I, I can wait. Never mind. So he's buried alive in this box. And he's trying to explain what happened to this FBI agent. He said, you know, we were driving these trucks. The truck in front of me, uh, you know, kids were throwing rocks at us. The mm-hmm. truck in front of me blew up. All of a sudden, we had, you know, soldiers on us that had uh, guns. Somebody hit me with a rock and I passed out. And he's hysteric. So he's not able to get the story out coherently or like to make it make sense. But what really is like the first of like, who's really on his side and who's just yeah. fucking with him comes up because there's a long pause after he explains the story and the special agent Harris says why is it they why is it that they didn't shoot you implying well they shot all his other friends all the other drivers but why didn't they shoot him and Ron Rose is like I don't know probably to put me in this box to get a ransom out of it's me like, you know if I had an answer I would fucking tell you special agent Harris exactly so jackass so uh the connection goes out and he loses you know he's not he's his phone cuts out um I gotta say, dude, Ryan Reynolds' performance in this movie, this is my next note, is just pure genius. Again, like, that's why anyone that says Ryan Reynolds is not a good actor needs to see they this They can movie. go fuck themselves. He's he's making so much out of so little. He tries to, you know, make phone calls again. He, like, maneuvers around the the uh, the box. And uh, it turns out that, you know, I believe Special Agent Harris is the one that tells him, you know, if you're able to get us, give us a phone call, that means you can't be buried more than two to three feet. Yeah. Because you're able to get a reception. So that's even worse. It's knowing that he's so close to freedom. Like two or three feet yeah, is nothing. Yeah, he's right there. Is nothing. Except when you're under fucking ground. Yeah. So the phone goes out. And it, this is actually where Ron Reynolds gets a phone call. 
So he gets a phone call from an unknown number. He doesn't recognize the number. And he picks up. And it turns out this is the person who put him there. Uh, I don't know if we ever get the guy's name. But it, he is uh, uh, a, a, a foreigner. I, I, is it I, Iraqi or is that the right, the right word for it? Uh, I don't know. I think so. A gentleman from Iraq who we're just You're gonna asking simply, the wrong. We're person, simply going to refer to him as "quote unquote" the terrorist because that's what Ryan Riddle refers to him okay. as. Not saying that he is a terrorist, indeed, but we'll talk about that later because that's actually one of the questions that I want to bring up. But basically, the the terrorist says, you know, I need five, "quote unquote" five million money by nine o'clock tonight. Uh, as Ryan Reynolds is getting this phone call, I should mention before he answers, he writes with his pen on the top of the. Uh, the uh the coffin the word help yeah as in maybe this person's calling to help me out and after he finds out this is a ransom thing he hangs up and he crosses out that word help which yep. i think is a perfect beautiful shot it's so great so simple but and the shots are so good in this speaking movie. of shots this is where we start get, well, this is our inciting oh, incident this the, is where we figure out what the, the plot of the movie is we get this beautiful shot where ryan reynolds rolls over on his side and we the camera just pans out and all we see is uh, just this little Zippo lighting up Ryan Reynolds' face in the coffin. That's all we see, and everything else is just blackness. Oh, it's so gorgeous. I Perfect. love, hate this movie so much. Okay. So Ryan Reynolds snaps to it, and he decides he's going to make another phone call. He makes a phone call to his house phone, and he gets the answer machine. Turns out he has a son who's probably, I want to say, like probably six to eight, and he has a wife. Uh, so he doesn't, he leaves a voicemail saying, you know, to his wife, I can't remember what his wife's name is, but he says, you know, call me as soon as you get this. And he hangs up the phone and he decides to make another phone call. And I'm assuming this is maybe his wife's sister or something, but her name is Donna. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> fuck Donna and her voicemail because yep. she does that asshole fucking thing where her voicemail is a joke. But she says, hello, Ryan Reynolds starts telling her, look, I'm buried and alive in a box. I'm, you know, whatever. And we get the fool ya. Sorry, this is my voicemail, and yeah. This is why you don't do those kind of voicemails. Yeah. Something like this could happen. So, after a moment... Probably. After a moment, uh, Donna call uh, picks up the voicemail, because he's leaving a message for her. She picks up the phone and says, you know, Paul, uh, I was just running out to the store, and, you know, whatever. Uh, he's basically saying, look, I need you to look up uh, Creston Rowland, whatever's phone number. I need to call him. Uh, Because it's an emergency. And she's like, you know, she even says, you know, I'm just walking out to the store. He's like, look, I need to get this number. And she's, okay, why is she not cooperative? If she is indeed anyone that, she obviously knows him. Right. She knows he's in a war zone. If you were in a war zone and you called me and were like, dude, I need you to get me this phone number right now. It's important. I'd be like, okay, obviously some shit is going down. Well, I think first off, you'd be like, why the fuck are you in a war zone? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but yeah, he is like... That would be the second question, he's though, for sure. He's basically screaming at her, get me the fucking number, and she hangs up, and he starts losing his shit, because he's like, no one is wanting... It understands the urgency here. No one is empathetic to my situation. Uh, he calms down, and he calls her back. And he, he says, Donna, I'm sorry. I did not mean to yell at you. I just really need you to give me this phone number. Otherwise, I am going to die. Uh, and she's a little more like cooperative in the sense she's like, what? what? Okay, whatever. Well, here's the phone well, number. Why didn't you say that? Yeah, basically. And it's so great because she gives him the phone number and he goes, okay, fuck you and hangs up the phone. <laughs> and I love it because that's so <laughs> perfect. Um, so here's what I will say. That is one thing I took away from this movie. I have hung up the phone like that so many times. This is so great because this is where we get a little bit of humor, but at the same time, it's supposed to be thrilling and dramatic. Yeah. I have to say, I love snap zooms. I absolutely love snap zooms. Tarantino uses them all the time. Scorsese uses them. I fucking love snap zooms. He makes the phone call to CRT and he gets picked. I guess this like receptionist picks up the phone and he's trying to explain the story of what's going on. And every time he's speaking, she's asking a question. He's it's snap zooming in. Mm -hmm. It's not zooming in. It's not zooming in. It's so great. Like it's so intense. And she basically puts him on hold. And there's like this cute little like elevator music. And he's like, dude, I am in a fucking box in the middle of the <laughs> desert on the other side of the world. And you're putting me on hold. <laughs> and that's what the expression you get from his face. Because it's like, it's oh, supposed yeah. to be comedic. Anyways, uh, this woman answers and she's like, uh, you know, uh, Paul, we're here to help you out. And he, he freaks out. He's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't even give you my name. How do you know my name? 
I didn't give it. To, I haven't given my name to the other guy. How do you know my name? And it's this paranoia where, you, where Ryan Reynolds is starting to lose it. Yeah, you're not. He doesn't know who he can trust. What's going on? You know, whatever. But she makes a comment saying, you know, you did call and leave a voicemail. We've got to mention that he left a message with uh, Alan Davenport, who is in charge of CRT. That's right. And he doesn't answer. So apparently, someone at CRT got in touch with uh, this hostage crisis situation which what a voicemail that would be to stumble upon oh yeah must have like oh let me check my voicemail oh so yeah shit. she's like well look this is where we got your name from so obviously she knows a little bit about this situation um and she makes it he's you know he tells her look this guy basically said if i don't give him five million dollars tonight he's gonna leave me here to die he's gonna leave he's if i don't give me if i don't get him five million dollars that's it and she says, or what? And he says, or else he'll take me to fucking SeaWorld. What do you think, lady? Which I laugh at that line every fucking time. The SeaWorld line is fucking amazing. The like the little sprinkle of humor that you get in this movie, and that's a yeah. good one. Because Ryan Reynolds is a funny dude. Yeah. It's like it's like remember when we were talking about Hard Candy where it's like there's humor in it, but it doesn't hit because yeah. you're uncomfortable. This movie, the humor knows where it belongs and it Yeah, hits. no, like I'm so uncomfortable and stressed out during this movie, but even I like smile. Mm-hmm. During like like that Sea World line, yeah, I'm always like. Huh, huh. So this woman again is unempathetic, really, to what's going on, and she's like, you know, you're you're you need to calm down. You're being too frustrated, or whatever. And he's like, frustration, lady. I'm literally going to fucking die in here, yep. and it's just another another hammer. He's he's trying so hard to make these people understand, and I feel like this is at this point, this is a movie about customer service where you're trying. To explain to someone your problem and no one seems to care or understand. Yep. And I feel for Ryan Reynolds so bad because I might not be buried in a box in the middle of the desert trying to explain some of my problem, but I've been on the other line trying to explain some of my issue and they just don't care or understand. Um, he even makes a comment that I love. I think this is the best part of the, the best line in the movie. He says, you know, he, she's, she's like trying to talk over him saying you need to calm down. We're working as hard as we can. And, uh, he says, you don't go looking for something you don't know is missing. Which I think that could be the tagline of the that movie. That line is so good. But basically saying, What was the tagline for the movie? Uh, I don't remember. I think it basically is something like buried underground, or 90 like minutes to. to live, something like that. Um, but she says, I'm going to connect you with Dan Brenner, who is the head of a hostage working group. And that's where Ryan Reynolds realizes the situation. He is technically a hostage. And he gets this moment of like, holy shit. Um, so... He leaves a message with Dan Brenner to call him back because Dan Brenner isn't there. After this, uh, he gets a phone call again from the quote unquote terrorist. And he's basically saying, the terrorist is saying, you can get me the money from the embassy because Ryan Reynolds is saying, you know, I don't have $5 million. My family doesn't have $5 million. And they said, well, you give me the money from the embassy, get it by me tonight. And Ryan Reynolds is starting to get a little hot headed. He's like, you know what? You're a terrorist. That's why the U.S. wasn't, isn't going to, you know, mm-hmm. pay you. And the the man on the line says, terrorist? You think I'm a terrorist? You're terrified, so that makes me a terrorist, right? He said, yeah, absolutely. He's like, you're a common criminal or whatever. And this is where I kind of start to empathize with the terrorist. I mean, I don't condone his actions, but I kind of understand. He says, you know... Uh, Last week, you were sympathizing with, with pedophiles. The pedophiles. Pedoph- this pedophiles. week, you're like, yeah, terrorists. But he's like, he makes a good point. I don't point. even know you. He makes a good point. He says, uh, you know, I'm not a terrorist. I'm... You know, I had five kids uh, before your 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 soldiers bombed us. Now I only have one. He's True. like, you know, I wasn't responsible for Saddam Hussein, but your country still bombed me. I wasn't responsible for Osama bin Laden. Your country still bombed me. And you know, there's this obviously this innu- this this hint that you know uh, this theme of we treat you know Muslim people or people from Iraq or Iran with uh, disrespect or like yeah. as if they are terrorists as if they're all somewhat involved in 9-11 which is not true obviously right and this is where you kind of get that duality of you know he's obviously taking things too far by putting this man in a coffin but is he he's kind of justified almost in his actions and like he he's not responsible necessarily for all this stuff he lost family he's lost his home and it's, it's kind of where you feel for both sides a little bit at this point you know you, you're like this guy actually is a real person and uh, this is where he makes a mention that there's a bag in the coffin that has other supplies in it. He says, you're going to make a ransom video for me, uh, and then I might let you go. Yep. And so <laughs> my he hangs up the phone, and Ryan Reynolds sees the bag at his end of his feet. And keep in mind, this coffin is probably only like four feet wide. maybe yeah, like, like three, It's a coffin. Maybe like three feet high. 
So it's very Not limited. Even that, I yeah, think. it's pretty low. But my comment, my my note here is that no one will be seated during the intense turning in the coffin scene because there's like a four minute scene here where Ryan Reynolds has to turn his whole body yep. on the, to the opposite side of the coffin to get to the bag, and it's gruesome because like you hear the coffin bowing, the wood bowing, and you feel you feel claustrophobic this whole movie. Yeah, and this scene and definitely I'm claustrophobic. Yeah, me too. Fuck this movie, man. Yeah, this movie is hard to Why watch. Why do you make every me time. watch it again? <laughs> So he gets this note, this ransom note that the man wants him to, to read and record on the Blackberry, uh, the phone to send to him to make a ransom video. And I actually wrote down exactly what the note says. And it's, it's interesting because there's, there's obviously some grammatical errors and spelling errors because it's obviously English isn't this dude's first language. Yeah. So I, I want to read it to you. I just think it's interesting. Uh, it says, the day is October, uh, is, the day is 23rd of October and October is misspelled. Yep. Yeah. I am Paul Conroy. I live in Hastings, Michigan, America. I am kidnapped in Iraq, buried in ground. And ground is misspelled. Ground. Uh, send five million money U.S. by nine hours night, or I will be die. Uh, people will call you with place money needs be help. I have a friend who talks exactly like that. Really? Yeah. It's is awesome. he foreign? She. Oh, she is she foreign? Yeah, super. Oh, okay. She's a Canadian. So. You know, Ryan Reynolds is looking inside. He's got this glow stick that's in there that he uses so he doesn't have to use the Zippo or the phone, uh, preserve less oxygen and save the phone's battery power. He's got a knife, probably like a little size pocket knife, uh, and this ransom note. And he also has a, a, a canteen with whiskey. We find out that he obviously, he obviously has like some kind of panic attack disorder yeah. and no medication. Uh, this canteen is filled with, I'm assuming, whiskey uh, that he can drink or, you know, whatever. It's my kind of dude, man. Yeah. So basically, uh, he he's just kind of contemplating, like, do I make this ransom video or not? And everyone so far has been telling him, you know, keep this as contained as possible. We don't want yeah. this getting out. And that's just them way of, Ron Reynolds even says, this is just a way of covering your tracks and making sure this doesn't get, you know, people don't know what how shitty the American policy is to not negotiate with terrorists or whatever. Yep. Uh, and this guy calls back, the terrorists call him back, and they have another conversation. He says, you know, if you, oh, I'm sorry. It's not the terrorist. It's uh, Dan Brenner. Dan Brenner finally gets in touch. The, he's the head of the hostage group. Finally gets in touch with uh, with Paul. And they start talking about, you know, he tells them, what's your situation? All this stuff. He starts taking down notes. He's like, look, we're going to try and find you. Um, you know, just hang in there. Stay calm. And he's the only one that cares about yeah. Ron Reynolds at all. Makes he's the only one that's worse. empathetic. Uh, so he's basically telling these stories like, look, tons of people get taken over here. Our job is to find them. We found dozens. Um, and he mentions Mark White is one of the people most recently that he rescued. Uh, Mark White. Mark White. You know, you know Mark, he says, you know, we rescued them. He was also buried alive. Ryan Reynolds says, well, where's he at now? He says, I don't know. He's probably just back with his family. Probably happy to be home. You know, he's out of the war zone. It's like, why are they burying people alive all the fucking time? To get ransoms, dude. That's <sighs> that's really the whole point of the movie. Um and then, you know, Paul was like, why the fuck did they put me here? This guy's a fucking terrorist, blah, blah, blah. And Dan Brenner says, you know, how do you know? Why do you, why do you think he's a terrorist? And it kind of goes back to what the, what the actual guy was saying. Yeah. He says, you know, if your family was hungry and starving, what would you do for him? And Ron Reynolds says, you know, I wouldn't kill somebody. And Dan Brenner says, you know, how can you know for sure if you've never been put in that situation? Yeah. Which has got a good point. I don't know what I would do. I, the the you know the green answers you know I wouldn't kill somebody for that but you never the know fuck I wouldn't well I mean just say, the, the 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 general public's answer is most likely you know yeah the, uh never mind yeah so I was about to say something really insulting this next scene is if you wanted to cry in this movie this is the scene because at this point you're most likely have been claustrophobic you've been uncomfortable. You've been, you know, gasping for air this whole movie. This movie is just going to put, pun unintended, the literal nail in the coffin for you. Because, uh, you know, Dan uh, Paul I Paul that. realizes that he's not going to be able to get this money to this guy. Mm -hmm. So Dan Brenner is his only hope. And he's just basically got to wait it out. So he decides he's going to make another phone call. And he calls this assisted living place. And speaks with his mother. Oh, and he starts man. talking to his mother, and he's like, "You know, hi, it's Polly. How you doing, mom? Did you get the flowers I sent you?" And his mom makes a comment. She's like, "Oh yes, dear." And he's like, "She goes, uh, you know, I'm just playing rummy or playing cards with your father." And 
uh, Ryan Reynolds has this moment where he's like, oh, shit. And that's when you start to realize that his mother has Alzheimer's because Ryan Reynolds says, you know, yeah, I don't think dad is with there. Is there with you? He's like, you know, I'm just calling to tell you this might be the last time I talk to you. I just wanted to tell you I love you. And his mom is so far gone with this dementia or Alzheimer's that she can't even think to say I love you back. And she even repeats it saying, you know, I play f- cards with your father every night. And, you know, it's this the music swells and it's so fucking sad, dude. Like, I don't know why I tortured myself with this movie, but it's so fucking sad. <laughs> and I think this movie could have been just this scene as a short film. Oh, my and would God. And would have been that would have been just incredible. as Yeah. And he hangs up the phone and just starts crying. And we get another one of those shots pulling out of the coffin, showing you the scope of the empty, vast blackness that's all around him and how he's truly alone, both here in the moment and in the world. Yeah. Uh, and it, it cuts to black, and we sit in black for a long time. Uh, yeah, just yeah re- we do. Just reeling on like the emotional limit. It's almost like an intermission. Yeah, they're like, like we know what we just put you through. Take a minute. Yeah. You know, Collect yourself. Yeah. You know. Um and then the scene comes back with the crackling of a glow stick open and Ryan yep. Reynolds is visibly terrified. And he's yeah. moving, he's moving slowly and you have no idea what's going on because there's no sound or anything except for his heavy breathing. And he's pushing the glow stick further down his body so he can see, and it turns out something is uh under his clothes. And it's moving further and further down his body, all the way down to his legs. And turns out it's a large snake. Has apparently yep. got into the coffin, into his clothes, and is coiled up at the end of the coffin. God. And this, again, is... It's, like, it's bad enough already. God damn it. Mm-hmm. This, again, is just... Oh, man. The, the, the master class in suspense that Hitchcock would have yeah. loved. Because this whole scene now is dead quiet other than the snakes rattling and Ryan Reynolds is breathing. And he's, his plan is he's going to basically throw some of the whiskey from the canteen on the snake and then light it on fire with the Zippo. And Which, that's a bold move. Especially when you're in a wooden coffin. Yeah. So he goes to throw the Zippo and the coffin instantly goes up uh, with the snake fleeing out of the hole it came in. As this is happening, the glow stick has fallen out of his hand and has begun melting, uh, as well as the cantina whiskey, just ever so slightly, like, making its way, dripping towards the fire. So, and not to mention, the phone is also ringing. Someone is calling Ron Reynolds, so he's stuffing the hole that the snake came in to make sure it doesn't happen again. He's trying to reach for the phone. He's trying to make sure the fire, the, the whiskey doesn't reach the fire. And it's just a crazy, hectic fucking moment. Oh um, my god! So I'm just over here just stressing out. Yeah, thinking just thinking about, about it. it. Yeah. So this scene goes on for a it's while, but oh, thank you, thank you, computer. But uh, he Good manages. Morning, sir. He manages to get the fire out, and he gets to the phone. It turns out he missed a phone call. Uh, but before he uh he answers the phone, before he calls the person back that called him, which essentially was the terrorist. Yeah. He all of a sudden has his. He, this plan and i think this is great because apparently this must mean he knows the ins and outs of the blackberry operating system because he manages that to scroll all through the phone and get the phone into english and with that he's able to find out the phone number of his phone yep. as well as the phone number for the terrorist phones the phone so he realizes that he missed a, missed a phone call and he receives a media message and he downloads the media message and it's a photo of of a woman bound and gagged with an AK-47 to her head. And Ryan Reynolds starts flipping his shit. He calls the terrorists. You know, he's like, uh, you have to make a ransom video now or we will blow this woman's head off. He's saying, you know, don't shoot her. She's got kids. And we don't know again who this woman is. She's just some woman that he knows. Uh, so he's like, look, I'll make the ransom video. I'll do it. And so he hangs up the phone and he makes this ransom video and he sends it to the guy. Uh... And he just lays there, and after a few minutes, uh, he gets another media message, and they didn't care. They shoot Pamela right in the face. Right in the fucking head. And it's gruesome. Ryan Reynolds throws up everywhere. He's sickened. He can't take it. Uh, so the last thing you want to do when you're in a coffin is vomit all over yourself. Yeah. Although he did just 
fight a snake with fire inside yeah. the coffin, so never mind. So he calls Dan Brenner back and he tells him, he's like, look, why didn't you why didn't you save her? And apparently Dan Brenner knew all about this situation. Yeah. He even says, you know, we didn't know she'd been taken. Uh, you know, why taken. did you... Didn't know it was taken. Why did you make that ransom video? It's already got 48,000 views on YouTube. Now the... <laughs> It was 30 pretty, seconds ago. Yeah. Now the terrorists have no choice but to follow Why through with I get their that threats. Kind of marketing? Yeah. Um, and as he's on the phone, um, something happens where he realizes that uh, he's under a mosque. Uh, that uh, Ryan Reynolds is buried under a mosque because he's hearing a prayer chant and he's hearing the music playing. So he realizes, you know, he tells Dan Brenner, there, you know, you can help me out. And uh, something happens where. Turns out uh, some F-16s have begun a bombing run on the city. Mm-hmm. And as they're bombing the mosque, uh, Ryan Reynolds' coffin starts to break and sand begins seeping in yeah. at a rapid rate. Uh, he manages to to secure the hole for a little bit, but, you know, as he's doing that, you know, sand is pouring in. He's telling Dan Brenner and he loses the phone call and uh, he gets another phone call from Alan Davenport. Oh, who is the personal the personnel director of CRT, which is the company that Paul Conway works for? I made a note here because this is the fuck you scene of the movie. But I made a comment here that he doesn't. Alan Davenport, who is Paul Conroy's boss, doesn't call until the ransom video comes out. You realize that, right? I never noticed that until. Oh yeah, no, no, no. So Alan Davenport calls and says, Piece "You know, of shit. he's like, you know, I've been." Uh, informed of your situation uh i want to turn i'm going to turn on a uh recorder right now for the remainder of this phone call and keep in mind that this is all going on while paul is trying to secure this hole so sand doesn't pour through and basically what we learn from this phone call is that paul was quote-unquote fraternizing or having relations with another crt employee who were i guess we're led to believe is pamela the woman that was shot in the video uh, and it's against company policy of CRT for mm-hmm. employees to be fraternizing with one another, which we're never led to believe if they indeed were having a relationship, an affair, or if it was just a misunderstanding. A, I, I I don't think they were. I think they were like they were close. I think they were friends, yeah, and it was misconstrued as right. And again, this also could be why CRT chose to do this thing. They could have just gone looking and were grasping at straws. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Basically, this scene boils down to CRT has fired Paul Conroy earlier that morning, uh, so they wouldn't have any involvement with his uh, ransom. Just again, from bad to worse. So this not only movie. not only is CRT washing their hands of the situation, but it turns out that now because Paul Conroy is not technically an employee there. His insurance policy won't go towards his family and his yeah. his uh, wife and and son, so he's leaving them with nothing. Such bullshit, dude. And you know, Alan Davenport turns off the recorder, and um, you know, he says we can't be held accountable for any injuries that take place. Paul makes a comment to Alan. You know, he calls him a piece of shit. But he, after the recorder gets turned off, he says, "You know, you put me here," is what he says. And Alan says, I'm sorry, and hangs up the phone. Which, I mean, I obviously don't take it literally How the that... the fuck is Alan Davenport sleeping at night? I don't take it literal that, that uh, you know, Paul is there because of Alan Davenport. I just think it's interesting that, that's, that he's accusing him. He's saying, you put me here. Like, you're, I'm not getting rescued because of you. <laughs> so, yeah, Paul is literally left with only one option, and that's for... Uh, dan brenner but he doesn't have any faith left so he yeah. at this point he's, he's a beaten he's man. kind of gone through the stages of denial and grief and now he's at the point of just acceptance he's just done he doesn't care uh he calls dan brenner back and he says you know it's over isn't it you're not gonna find me he's like you bombed the city how can you find out from the guy where i'm at if he's dead and dan brenner's like i know he's like did you guys know that I was here when you bombed it. <clears throat> and they said, uh, he says, yeah, we did know that you were there, which I mean, it's not Dan, uh, it's not Dan Brenner's, you know, military that's doing it. It's the military that's doing it, but Dan Brenner knew that the military was going to be there right. and didn't stop it. Um, 
And Paul makes a comment to him saying, it's over, isn't it? And Dan Brenner says, no, no, no. And then he kind of just, a, a pause goes by and he goes, yeah. So basically, Paul is realizing that he's not getting rescued and that no one can no one can save him. He's realizing that the terrorist guy is dead, so there's no way anyone can find him. And he just sits there and in the coffin as sand is slowly seeping in. Uh, then he takes his phone, the BlackBerry phone, who's it's only got like one little bar of service left anyway, of battery left, and decides he's going to record another video. And uh, it turns out this video is his will and testament, which again, if you wanted to fucking cry, now is the fucking time. Uh, because he's leaving a message to his son where he's saying, you know, I don't have much. You can have my clothes. Maybe you'll grow into them one day. Uh, he tells his wife that he loves him, that he should have taken her word and never taken this job over here. And it's again, it's just fucking sad to, to see all this shit after all this dude, the shit this guy's gone through to see that this is I, how it's going to end. I can't handle it. It's rough. It's if you've so made it this rough. Far, if you made it this far, I congratulate you, but you're not going to get rewarded for making no. it. It's only going to get fucking worse. Uh, so Paul gets another another uh, phone call, and it turns out it's from the quote unquote terrorist guy. Of course, and he's realizing, oh shit, this guy is not dead. There's still a chance I can be saved. So the terrorist guy is telling him, you need to show blood, or we're going to to uh, kill your family. And Paul's like, what are you talking about? You're in Iraq. My family is in, you know, overseas. And, he's, and the terrorist makes a note and says, he basically tells him Paul's address. Yeah. And he's like, you know, you looked at my driver's license. That's the only way you knew it. Like, and he's he's like, not fucking around. He's like, uh, you don't know where where they're at. And he's like, Hastings, Michigan. He's like, well, you looked at a map, you know, trying basically to convince himself there's no way this dude can find his yeah. family. And uh, Paul eventually starts to take these threats seriously. Yeah. And the guy's like, you've rightfully got, so. He's like, you got like an hour to give me the money, basically, the five million dollars, or we'll kill your family. So he hangs up and he makes another phone call back to his house. And again, no one's there; it's just the answering machine. So Paul leaves a message saying, you know, don't come home. He knows they know where uh, where we live. Do not go home. Uh, I believe he calls her cell phone actually, he, and not her house phone. He's like, don't I go would home. hope he's not calling the yeah. house phone because that's a pointless. Yeah, I just realized that. So he's like, don't go home. They know where we live. You know, go somewhere safe. But uh, after that, he calls Dan Brenner and says, you know, dude, uh, Dan, uh, they know where we're at. Uh, I mean, you know, yeah. the guy is still alive. Uh, and here's his phone number because he switched the phone over. You know, he's right. like, OK, Paul, we're, we're going to come get you now. He's like, just hang in there and only be a little bit longer. Um, so the terrorist guy calls back in because more sand is seeping in. And it's even faster now. Yeah. Uh, and the guy has been seeping out ever since. Yeah, the, the guy's basically he's only got like five minutes left. Yeah. And the guy, the terrorist guy is basically saying, you know, either you cut your finger off uh, in the next 60 seconds. Because doesn't hmm? the Brenner guy like didn't they find someone that. Right. They found someone during the bombing of the city that says they know where Ryan Reynolds is buried. Yeah, that's what. Like, and they, so he's like, like, look, we got we know where you're at. We're coming like, to get you. Just they, hang in we there. know where they buried the American or something like that. But right. But right before this happens, the terrorist calls the guy calls Ryan back and says, you know, either cut your finger off or we're going to kill your family, basically. Yeah. And so Ryan Reynolds takes the knife that he's given and shoves a rag in his mouth, his a shirt in his mouth and cuts his pinky off. Uh <sighs> And it's gruesome, dude. We oh, see it from yeah, the point do, of view of the BlackBerry. Not cut away. I mean, they don't have anything to cut away to. So, yeah, we're gonna so they record, to he it. records it and sends the guy the video. And uh, so Ryan Reynolds is basically wrapping his hand up. He's hyperventilating. The sand's pouring in. And all of a sudden, we hear shovels. We hear shovels digging out dirt. Uh, we hear a bunch of men yelling, a bunch of uh, soldiers yelling. And all of a sudden, we're seeing Ryan Reynolds. And the, the lid of the coffin slides off. And there's the bright sunlight uh, he starts to smile and he realizes he's being rescued. And uh, you hear a voice, you know, saying, "Are you okay?" You know, everything. Which I wrote down. How shitty would it be to be rescued? Not, not, not even sixty seconds after you cut off your finger. Don't matter if I'm getting the fuck out of that coffin. <laughs> cut them all but off. Let's go. Give me the be? fuck out. That would be like, like, oh well, we'll get there when we t eventually talk about this movie because it's got to come up. But that's like the mist where you shoot your son to, yeah. to death. And then to be you know, spared from yeah. this nightmare, only to be rescued minutes later. Still, <laughs> I'll lose a finger if it gets me out of that fucking coffin, dude. But yeah, so Ryan Reynolds is getting rescued. The lid comes off the coffin. All we see is like the bright light from the sun hitting his face as he's smiling. And then we cut, and it turns out he hasn't been rescued at all. JK, bitches. It was a hallucination. So 
jokes on you for even thinking that was going to happen. But uh, he's the sand's still pouring in, and Dan Brenner calls him. You know, and Ryan Reynolds has probably got to take deep breaths right now. Yeah, right now I'm going to hyperventilate. End. This is the last like three minutes of the movie. So Dan Brenner calls him back saying, you know, Paul, you can hear him in a Jeep. They're, they're yeah, going, like, they're bucking it down coming, the road. We're coming, we're on like, our way. Paul, we're close by, uh, you know, just hanging there. He's like, and Paul's telling Brenner, he's like, dude, there's sand is literally up yeah. to my chin. I don't have much longer. You've got to like, hurry. Dude, we know right where you are. We're coming for you. Yep. And he, and he gets a, another phone call and Paul's like, look, that's my wife calling. I've got to answer it. And Dan is like yelling at him, do not hang up the phone. Do not hang up the phone. And Paul's like, I got to answer it. It's my wife. And he answers the phone, and finally his wife Linda's talking to him. And this is where the music is swelling. I, I gotta say, Linda's score is so oh, fucking heartbreaking. It rips your heart out, it's dude. It's these solemn strings oh being God. pulled, and it's just uplift. It's supposed to be uplifting and heartbreaking at the same time. Sand is pouring even faster through this coffin. He's maybe got six inches yeah. before it's filled. And they're telling, you know, Linda's like, I'm sorry, I've been away. I'm, I love you so much. Please come home to me. Promise me you'll come home to me. I'm not a fucking dare, right? <laughs> Dude, I'm, me too. And uh, I have a bigger emotional reaction God. to this movie than I do Blue Valentine. Dude, yes. And I'm already getting teary eyed up there. <laughs> um, oh so Linda's God. saying, you know, I'm so sorry. And Paul's apologizing, saying, I'm sorry. You know, I should have never came over here. And she says, I don't care about that. I just want you home. Promise me you're coming home. He's like, yes. He's like, there's. God. Paul's saying they're around the corner. They're, they're minutes like away. They're here, they're they'll they'll be rescuing. And then it's like, they're saying, I love you so much back and forth to each other. As the music is still swelling. Yes. It's so impactful and powerful. Uh, he's like, look, you know, they're calling me. He hits another phone call from Dan Brenner. He's like, look, I got to go. They're calling me. They're, res- they're about to rescue. And she's like, you know, I love you so much. And she, she's like, uh, she's like, call me the second you get out. Yeah. And he's like, I will. I will. Oh, and he answers God. the phone. And you can hear on the other end of the phone is Dan Brenner and some more soldiers, and they're digging. You hear the shovels. Yeah, he's, he's like, he's like we're he's coming, like, Paul. We're you know, coming. He's like, hurry. You know, hurry up. He doesn't have much longer. And they're digging. They're digging. And Dan's like, Paul, just hang in there. He's like, we're, we're oh so my close. God. It's and coming. Paul is like, you know, hurry. I'm, I've literally got like three inches like, like, left of space. Not the even sand, three inches. The I think. sand like, it's is around almost his in face. his mouth. And he's like, you know, I can't hear you. Are you, are you nearby? Are you coming? He's like, I don't hear anything. And the music is still swelling. And then the music just stops. And, and can I say it? You go for it, dude, because I'm about to fucking, fucking cry right now. So the music stops. And, and what is what is all you hear what does Brenner say? Brenner say is Oh God, he brought us to Mark White. God, dude, all you hear is this. But the fucking music stops, and Brenner just just goes, "Oh my god!" You hear it like on the other end, right before that the coffin has been ripped off, and obviously it's not Ryan Reynolds' coffin because he's still the sand is still pouring in. Keep in mind, we never leave the coffin, so this is all over the phone, and Ryan Reynolds is just in shock. He's like, "What's happening? What's going on?" Because he doesn't know. Yeah, like he's freaking the fuck out. He's like, I can hear the shovels on the phone, but like, what? What the, what's fuck, happening? What the fuck? What's happening? He's probably got sand in his ears. He yeah. can't fucking hear very well, and all you hear is him saying he, that the guy led us to Mark White, and he's just saying, "I'm sorry, Paul. I'm so sorry." And that's when the music swells up again, and the, the literal the last images of the movie are just a sliver on your screen. Of Ryan Reynolds with his face pressed to the lid of the coffin, just saying to himself, "Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no," as the sand fills up and fills the whole screen to black. And that's it. The music cuts out, and we're left we're left in silence and blackness for a moment before you hear Dan Brenner say again, "I'm sorry, Paul. I'm so sorry." And that is it. That's fucking it. That there's no. Oh my god! Glimmer this, of this is by far the. Uh, dude, I'm over here fucking like, dude. Like, same. I'm like, I am fanning my face. I'm like, try like wiping my fucking <laughs> eyes right now, because I cannot handle that ending. <sighs> he brought Holy us fuck. to Mark White. So not only did Brenner lie, turns oh out god. that and Mark like, White. That's the, like. That's the last thing, Ryan. Like that's the last thing Paul hears. 
before he dies. Like before he dies, he hears no. Like it would have been fine if he heard his wife. Maybe yeah, maybe not fine, but better than hearing we lied to you like, this whole time. Yeah, like you would not have like we would not be in fucking tears right now mm-hmm. yeah. if the last thing he heard was like his wife saying I like I love you. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. He ends that phone call. To get on this one. He hangs out thinking he's going to be safe. He's telling his wife, I'm coming yeah, back to he's you. Like, he's like, I promise. Yeah, oh, my God. Just to get back on the phone with someone. The only other person that's supposed to give him hope and, like, understand his situation fucking lied to him. Whether it was intentional or not. So, it turns out that this terrorist that they found while bombing the city was not the same one that Paul spoke to on the phone. And this guy, whether knowingly or not, accidentally brought him to Mark White's grave. So Paul, in his last moments of life, finds out that the one person that was supposed to care lied to him, that no one in this situation ever gets out alive, that he lied to his wife, he's never going to see him. Not only that, the company he worked for fucked him over, so he's not getting, his family's like getting his left family's with nothing. His family's not getting anything, yeah. And the last thing he has, he, can, he has like literal seconds of telling himself oh no oh god oh no before his he's yeah like dead. that's the thing like he's not getting like he's not getting closure like, like or like well ready. And, like just think about like how like he's not getting like shot in the head like instant death no. like he's being suffocated to death by sand after literally like everything bad that could happen like, to him I has happened to him cannot even fathom how horrible that is not only that he literally gets maybe five seconds of realizing what's happening. Yeah. Realizing everything that's happened before he's dead. Yeah. He's not getting closure at all. No. And fuck this movie. That's it. And fuck you for making me watch it again. Oh my God. Dude, this movie is a master class of writing, of suspense, of acting, of doing so much with so little, of how to make your audience care for your characters, I'm just, how to give them something and take it away from them. Um, okay. But let's talk about the the credits. Or do you have that? Worst else? song ever. <laughs> Holy fucking shit. So we end with blackness. We have a moment there before we hear Brenner say again, I'm sorry, uh, Paul, I'm so sorry. There's and a few more seconds. Then cut to the happiest little country <laughs> song you've ever heard it's in your life. The happiest folk song talking about living on a mountain. It, it's it's like a banjo. It's and it's like like uh, someone uh, pissed off the music supervisor <laughs> on that movie, and he was like, "I'm gonna fucking I get him on the, this I one." I think it's supposed to be one of two things. I think, and there, it's not both. It's one or the other. I think it's either it's supposed to be so jarring and like almost a slap in the face that you that they're like, "Wasn't that a happy ending?" Like to make you even more like somehow this this music just, supervisor it pisses me off. This music does. supervisor found a way to make you even more emotional in the credits. Like how hard is that? They found a way to do it. Right. Or they're like, okay, this movie was so fucking sad that we have to put some kind of happy music in there to bring you back. And then it did the total opposite. Well, it's I, one or the other. <laughs> and it's I the think, former. For I me. think the I think the second one. Was what they were trying to do, but the second, the first, and one the is first one is what actually happens. But yeah, you, I can't think of any other reaction if you're invested in this movie as you should be than to just listen to this song and go through the credits, thinking what the fuck just happened. Speaking of them trying to cheer us up, I'm gonna talk about something that does actually cheer me up: the taglines for the movie because they are so fucking bad. Hmm. I, I found five different taglines for this movie. And they're awful. Well, before we get there, we got to talk about the stinger credit. Ah, shit. So I always forget about that. The credits roll through this happy, jaunty little jingle is still playing. So after... Go ahead. <laughs> this is little jingle is playing. The credits keep rolling, but the music still plays. We go back to the coffin, and we're, we're uh, scrolling through the coffin... From Paul's point of view, of his little notes of that he's his little, made, because he keeps right. He was using this pen to write down phone numbers and names on the top of the coffin, and we scroll through, and the last one we see is Mark White as we roll into blackness. So another like, okay. kick you while you're so they literally down. stab you in the heart in the <laughs> like they stab you in the heart with that ending scene, and then that credit song like they roll through the credits, they they pull the knife out. Mm-hmm. Or try to with that song. And, and then they fucking start stabbing you again immediately. 
There's you don't get any closure with this movie. I don't understand that. Like, why did they feel the need to add that? <laughs> you don't get any closure that pisses from this me off movie more than the credits until song. after you walk away. The credits won't give you no. closure. The no, stinger no, no. won't give you closure. What's even sadder is after they show you the stinger scene, the music fades out, that everything else fades out, and it's just blackness, and you're left with your thoughts <laughs> and your loneliness. And that's it. That's the fucking movie. End of story. No buried two redemption. No, it, that's it. <laughs> I want to see that movie. Um, okay, happy tagline time. Okay. Are you ready for the first one? These are supposed to be happy? Or they, I mean, they make or, me or, happy because I think they're awful taglines. Oh, so they're taglines that don't fit at all. In my opinion, these are the actual taglines used for the movie. Okay. But I think they're awful. Okay. 100 and 170,000 square miles of desert. That's what I figured. Yeah. 90 minutes of oxygen. Yeah. No way out. That's stupid. That's so bare bones. It doesn't really give you the idea of what the movie's about. The second one, Paul Conroy isn't ready to die. I kind of like that one. That one's not awful. But that's more action revenge tale than, yeah. than what this is. Time is running out for Paul Conroy, which that just makes me want to listen to Muse. So Yeah. <laughs> This one's funny. Your fate is never sealed. Oh, puns. <laughs> it's always a good idea to put a pun in your tagline. And this one just directly contradicts the movie. Paul Conroy has just woken up buried six feet underground. He has a mobile phone, 90 minutes of oxygen, and no way out. They say he's buried like three feet underground in the movie. Two to three feet, yeah. They do that in one of the trailers I noticed too. They say, Which you know, I guess two times three is six. Two to three, though, not two times three. Yeah. I, I'm spitballing here, man. Anyways, <laughs> before we try to find a silver lining, and good luck, um, <laughs> there's a little bit of trivia, not much, but there are some things to talk about. Uh, seven different coffins were used in this movie, so yeah. I guess they could use different angles and stuff. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock's movies Rope and Lifeboat were an inspiration for the director, which we know that because this movie screams Hitchcock. Uh, Ryan Reynolds was indeed, uh, if if only briefly, was actually buried uh, in the shooting of the films. You know, the the end of the film there, the sand filling. Yeah, part. yeah. the crew had a, a team of paramedics waiting on standby. He's well, also been quoted as saying this was one of the hardest movies he's ever had to do, especially being buried in that coffin for that last scene. In regards to that first one, the seven coffins thing, because mm-hmm. I think me and you talked about, because me and you talk, have talked about this movie a lot. Oh, yeah. It's literally the reason why we're doing this podcast. Um, didn't you say they filmed this like in like someone's living room or some I, shit? I, they, it says that they shot it in a studio, but I do remember seeing like behind the scenes photos. Maybe it was like the director doing a rehearsal with Ryan Reynolds. And it literally was just a coffin with like the side missing and they were filming it in like his living room. So That's maybe that crazy. was just a test. And then they did it on for real on a studio, which this movie had to been so easy to shoot in terms of production. I had to think, cause like you have like <laughs> uh, nothing to go on. <laughs> how do you set dress a coffin? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the art direction didn't have much to do. So, but anyways, um, Ryan Reynolds has been quoted as saying that this was like the, the final scene in the movie where he was literally buried alive. Oh, oh, yo! He yeah. said he said he never wants to do it again, and he's still shaking up about it, even like a decade later. Same, yeah. And all I did was watch the damn thing twice uh, now. This film still is, pissed. <laughs> this film is. I've seen it like twenty two times. So you're a weird guy. I like torture myself with this movie. Dude. Like I said, I go Masochist. back to this movie <clears throat> all the time as like a well for like inspiration and how to shoot things and with like on such a low budget, but. Uh, the film is unique in that it never repeats a single shot. You never see the same shot. That's twice. insane. That means that shot list was ridiculous. Oh my god. I gotta find a copy of that somehow. So let's talk about logistics, about actually being buried alive. Uh, most estimates of how long someone could survive being buried in a coffin range from 60 to 90 minutes without an air source, which technically he didn't have an air source. Uh, it's longer if uh, the source has an airflow. Uh, in this case... Paul survived about 90 minutes because that's the runtime of the movie right? Uh, in the coffin. But he also panicked, breathed heavily, coughed, puked, talked on the phone, and burned a Zippo, which would use up a lot more oxygen. Yeah, than the just bur- like lighting that lighter would do some ruin damage. It. Yeah, so if he wasn't getting buried alive by the sand, he was suffocating from CO2 poisoning. Mm-hmm. So technically, this movie... Both awful been- ways to die. Oh, yeah. Technically, this movie should have been a lot shorter. <laughs> but... Uh, Mythbusters actually tried to test this myth out uh, to see if someone could survive being buried alive. Oh, shit. And they actually set their goal for two hours being buried six feet underground. So longer in both instances, time and, you know, distance. Mm-hmm. Um, 
That was a bold move. It turns out the the bigger problem isn't being, you know, the air source. It's being buried alive underneath all that weight uh, from the dirt. Uh, I actually saw the clip of them trying to do this, uh, that the weight of the dirt on top of the coffin would actually cause the coffin to bend inward. Oh, no shit. Bow. Yeah. Um, from the weight of the earth that's on it. And they couldn't even do the, like, in the in the, in the the show, you know, they had Jamie in the coffin and, like, yeah. a glass casing with six feet of, of dirt. And I think they maybe only got a couple feet before it started to bend inward and, you know, he could have been crushed to death. Oh, holy shit. So, they're they're like there's no possible way someone could so- survive, which makes me think, and this is a morbid thought, but does that mean that everyone we've buried underground oh. has their coffin defiled? Because six feet underground, no matter well, how lightly I mean, you're keep putting, in mind, traditionally we like. I mean, granted, Paul's buried in Paul's like those big, is, like bomb yeah. ass, like Cadillac. Paul's coffin is probably two by fours, but still, yeah. they used in the MythBuster show. They used a typical casket. Oh, like, did they? Yeah, and I'm like, that just makes me think how awful it must be, like under no, like, for everybody. Oh, it's a morbid thought, and I, I hate to bring it up. This is why I want to be cremated. This is why I just want my body thrown in the trash. I don't actually. Care. I would really prefer a weekend and burn your type situation. Yeah, but See, I prefer anyway. uh, a Frank from. Uh, it's always sunny. Just throw me in the trash. Oh, you know? you're right. Um, that's all the trivia I have. Now, the Mally, this is going to be... thing we've ever had to do. <laughs> this oh, is going to be euphoric. God. This is going to be a lesson unto ourselves. But this movie was the whole reason we chose to do this podcast. And So <sighs> we've been thinking about this movie for a long, since day weeks. One. Yeah, since day one. Um. Our job. Damn near about two months we've been thinking about this movie. (laughs) The tagline of the podcast, like, this is our job. What is the silver lining of 2010's Buried, if any? Um, Do you have anything? I got one. Is it a reach? Yep. All right, well, go ahead. I think mine might be a little more optimistic, maybe, but go ahead. Uh, You you go first. You want me to? Yeah, because... Yours is that much of a stretch? Yeah. All right. Uh, so we do know that in the movie that Paul puts out a ransom video and it's instantly a quote unquote hit uh, on YouTube where uh, he mentions that he's a truck driver for this uh, CRT, Creston Rowland, and I think Tomlin is the name. I have no uh, idea what CRT stands for. And he gets fired, obviously, by Alan Davenport on the recorded message. My only silver lining is... And unfortunately, it's not for Paul or his family because I really don't think there's much to mind there. But I do believe there will be justice for Paul, uh, much like we talked about with Heart Candy, where after the fact. Yeah. Uh, I think CRT is fucked. Oh, yeah. Like, they're... Not not financially. P- the, like, good luck, CRT, PR team. Yeah, your, your PR team is going to have a fucking Holy nightmare. shit. Because in the Ransom video, he mentions that he works for CRT, and Alan has this video... Where they fired uh, Paul Conroy the day uh, earlier in the day, so this is obviously going to be an investigation. Oh because yeah, because there's going to be public outcry about America's policy on negotiating oh, with CRT terrorists. CRT is getting the shit um, suit out of them. That's going to be the first thing. Is you know, CRT might have tried to wash their hands of this, but their company's reputation is going to be far worse than Comcast or EA or any other fucking company. They yeah. are fucking done. Love uh, those examples. In the public side, yeah. <laughs> um, they might still be a financial success because of what they do since they work with the military, but their reputation is going to be nigh impossible to recover from, at least yeah, for sure. in the general public side. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, they're, Paul's going to have justice. Uh, he's They're definitely getting sued. Kind of. They might not win, but they're definitely getting sued for the family, yeah, for pain and suffering. If so, it's going to be a long, drawn-out process. Either way, it's not going to look good for CRT. Uh, and in Paul's death, at least his family... Uh, we'll hopefully get some kind of, uh, you know, rep, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, whatever from Paul's death, some kind of, uh, something, yeah, God, I'm so money, sad. whatever, but some kind of closure and knowing that, you know, at least the company he worked for is getting fucked over. All so right. Mally? My turn. <laughs> um, okay. This is a bit of a stretch kind of, I don't know. I get like, same as you. I'm sorry. There's. It's There's no silver lining for Paul in this movie. <laughs> I just realized, why are we recording this in the dark? Because this is already a dark-ass movie, and we're sitting here with just our laptop screens illuminating the room. <laughs> we just like torturing ourselves, I think. Okay, it was light out <laughs> when we started this episode, and 
Yeah. It, as it, as it, it really it suited darker. the mood. Um, okay. My, the only thing I can think of as far as silver lining, mm-hmm. um, at least Mark White's family will have closure. So it's, yeah, it's kind of similar to, to what I had in mind. Yeah. I mean, that's like, really it. I mean, and for the characters themselves, there's not much you can go on. Because that's but. the thing with Paul is like, they don't, <laughs> ironically enough, Paul's family, like wife and son, they don't even have a body to bury. No, and they probably never will. No. Yeah. Unless but, they, I mean, like I mean, Mark White's family, like, yeah. they've, and then who, who knows how long Mark White's been buried there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's still a, a pretty good sort of lining. Both our characters will at least. Okay, after this is this, the one I think we thought about the most. Yeah. And at least at the end, both our characters will get retribution because Dan yeah, Brennan, I'm sure, is going to say something. You know what I mean? Hopefully he'll say something. Oh, shit. So that's it, dude. That's thanks for listening to this episode. Sorry we put you through that. If you've seen this movie, you know exactly how we feel, then I'm sure. Uh, so let's get optimistic. I mean, next week we begin our four part uh, Halloween special. Oh, I'm oh. sorry, five part. Five part Halloween, October extravaganza special, whatever you want to call it. Be- wait, before we get into next week and all that, uh-huh. let's give them something to bring them up a little bit. Oh, you're right. We didn't offer alternatives. Alternatives to this movie. What do you got, son? I'm going back with uh, another Ryan Reynolds classic. I mean, if you you know Ryan Reynolds, you know him for comedy. So why not watch another comedy with your with Paul Conroy in it? So I'm going with the class with just the the classic waiting. I mean, I think everybody everybody knows that movie. It's hilarious. He's hilarious in it. And that's definitely a way to laugh. Yeah, at he is. You. He is fantastic. He, Ryan Reynolds is a good actor. Fuck great, everyone. Great actor. Great actor. He is so good in waiting. Uh, uh, what do you got? My choice. I'm going with more of a white knuckle thrill ride. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I quote this movie once a day subconsciously without even realizing it. Uh-huh. I can almost guarantee it. What's that? Smoke and aces. <laughs> that was what I played around with. That's a good one too. That one kind of has a little bit. Oh, of a that ties into last week. Yeah, Joe Carnahan, two weeks in a row. That's a good. Point. Smoking Joe. That one does have a little bit of a downer ending, but it's like a f- it it's does a fun ride. But it's to a it. badass ending. Yeah, it's a fun ride too. I I went back and forth between Waiting and Van Wilder, but I think Waiting's a, a oh solid Van Wilder's another good one actually. Yeah. But that's that's a way to laugh. Or just and Ryan Reynolds is in your movie too, so that's another. Yeah, yeah that's a great movie, a great choice. Great, so great. Everyone is in. Literally everyone is in Smoking Aces. Yeah, yeah, everyone. Everybody. So. Again, uh, next week we start our five parter. Uh, I don't. Yeah. I guess we don't have a name for it, but yeah, our, our October. We'll come up with a really witty name. Yeah, for, by, uh, by uh, the next episode. Yeah. Uh, sh- oh, we should give them a little bit of a hint. Yeah. For what next week's gonna be. I actually, kind of have a hint for this one. Okay. Uh, for next week's episode, our first of five parts for our spoopy uh, October Halloween. Whatever Hashtag you call it. who's spooky? Yeah, who's spoopy? Uh, the f- what? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, f- the the hit I got for next week is uh, don't piss off old ladies. I think it's a solid hit. If you know the movie, you instantly Perfect. got it. So yeah, we start with our all horror themed uh, October special starting next week. Oh, so it's, it's the it's, it's the merriest time of year. We Fuck went you, through Christmas. an extensive list of all the horror movies we could do that have downer endings because. Some have downer endings. Some yeah, have like that a, twist. Like a lot of horror movies have downer endings, or like that last like little jump gotcha, scare. Yeah, but the, like the I feel like alive. these ones, like it's not a final jump scare. Like no, it's just a these are just fucking ending. Sad endings or fucked up endings. Yeah, uh, and I think what we're going for on the actual Halloween, our actual Halloween episode is. I could the, not be more happy. That's the best episode to do. The, the best movie to do oh for my that God. one. So be on the lookout, people. We have. Some fantastic fucking... If anyone can guess what the Halloween episode is, I will find you and give you a dollar. <laughs> um, thanks for listening, everybody, to this week's episode. Be on the lookout for next week. We've got a full lineup scheduled. Uh, you know, Since you're on iTunes already, please subscribe to our show. Please uh, leave us a rating and some feedback. Tell us what you like, what you don't like. Uh, if you have a movie that you think has a downer ending that we should review uh, and try to find a silver lining to, find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash silver linings. Uh, I believe it's Silver Linings Playlist, maybe. I can double check real quick. 
Uh, Again, something we should probably know. Yeah, you should probably we should probably know that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, facebook.com slash silver linings playlist, or you can just search for Ooh. us and find us and message us or leave us a comment. Tell us, hey, this movie is one you guys should do, and we'll definitely consider it. And it's yeah. probably one we already have uh, on our yeah, schedule, to be honest. We have a big schedule. <laughs> so that's it for Barry, dude. I feel like we did it. We did yeah. it justice. Uh, it was hard to get through. By far our most emotional episode. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, thanks for sticking around, literally listening to us, like, cry. <laughs> and no one's ever going to see it. That's the best part. It's just going to Good. Be, you, have to, you have to just know that that happened. Uh, huh. Do you have anything else you want to say, Mally, before we sign off here for the week? Oh, I'm going to wipe these tears away. But as always, Excelsior. Excelsior.